special effects. Let's see what this shit look like in the movies. Are from the movies in this. It's tiny mm. details like this that bring horror movie nightmares to life. From oh, building 13 it'd be feature heads like this one to sculpting paper thin prosthetics. Here's what eight scary movies look like behind the scenes. Oof. In Hellraiser, Pinhead's eerie final look involved a face piece, a headpiece that covered the skull cap, and a zip-up silicone neck that was like a choke. Oh, that was a girl? Transitioning onto the body. To make oh, that's not the original. The of the Cenobites appear as naked bodies with pins poking and pulling their flesh in disturbing ways. Special effects... That's crazy. Josh Russell made all the costumes and makeups out of silicone rather than the traditional foam latex. It created the illusion of translucency, like you'd see in actual flesh. Pinhead wore a two-piece undersuit that resembled muscle tissue, moving independently from the top skin, complete with glued-on hand appliances, and a flesh suit slipped over it all to complete the look. This bitch got design a designer skin suit. Shorty had that shit woke. How you got the shit woven on your chest? What the fuck? Why did you take the time to do that? Suit slipped over it all to complete. Got her skin designed. That's disgusting. Mia Goth plays both villain and hero in X, with one character decades older than the other. Director Ty West wanted to push the character design of Pearl and her husband Howard into monster territory, hinting at their sinister nature. That task fell on Weta Workshop in New Zealand, where prosthetics designer Jason Doherty was tasked with aging up both Mia Goth and Steven Yeur. His team brought out little nuances like skin discoloration and contact lens coloring to emphasize mm. And Howard's decrepitude, as seen through the younger character's eyes. And to make sure Mia Goth's performance could come through, the team had to make some prostheses so precise they were tissue thin and practically see through. For some scenes, Mia required some 30 individual prostheses, painstakingly applied by makeup designer Sarah Rubano and her team. Bro, sitting in that chair all day just to get a scene or two off, that's fucked up. Ooh, I ain't seen nope yet. I ain't seen that yet. I ain't seen that yet. Don't spoil that for me. I ain't seen that yet. Don't spoil that for me. Nah, uh, 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 uh. Where the next movie at? Is it still nope? What the fuck? This is still nope. The scene where Michael's killing protege jumps off a radio tower. Stunt coordinated violence. Okay. The film required heavy stamens of the slasher franchise. To make sure all this bloodshed only looked violent, the film required heavy stunt coordination and planning. For the scene where Michael's killing protege jumps off a radio tower, stunt coordinators Corey DeMyers and Kevin Scott split it up into two parts. First, they put actor Rohan Campbell on a line and dropped him onto the awning. Then Corey stepped in as a stunt performer to finish the second part, without wires or pads. Action! Oh. Corey also doubled as the new killer in this scene where he kills his mom. Mm. A gory sequence that didn't make the final cut of the movie. The scene involved a masked Corey stabbing through a pillow stuffed with feathers. A this nigga Michael got a protege. Piece of plywood in the back to provide an additional layer of safety. The team scored the pillows, making it easier for the dulled metal prop knife to break through and puncture the blood bag. The result was as intense as intended. Bloody feathers everywhere. Other grisly scenes involved wire gags, like when Michael kills Nurse Deb, leaving her hanging on the wall. 
The team hung super thin steel cable, known as magician's wire, to two eye bolts in the wall hidden behind the painting. The wire went through two tiny holes in the painting and hooked up to a sea harness that the actress was wearing under her wardrobe. Using such a small wire mm. in that dimly lit room made it relatively easy for VFX to clean up the shot in post. The final fights required weeks of rehearsal and pre-visualization. And with the amount of fake blood needed to sell the scenes, the team often needed to get everything right within the first few takes to minimize resetting time. So it should be blood <laughs> pumping from, from tears. Copy blood pumping. Ultimately, Jamie Lee Curtis's stunt double only did two shots in this final sequence, with Jamie herself handling 98% of her own stunts. It was her okay, Jamie. To smash Lori's Get it in, then. Make your pay. Cabinet, made out of breakable balsa wood and candy glass. Three, two, one, go! Ho ass! Nigga! For Prey, a prequel set 300 years before the Predator movies, the iconic Predator had to look more like a horror character with a less human face. This version of the creature, dubbed the Feral Predator, got a new suit and two fearsome hero heads, all created by Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr. The duo Why they have to look different? For the previous movies. It's still the same species. Seven tiny servos and the animatronic underskull could be operated via radio control by three to four off-screen puppeteers. All these motors gave the creature more movement in its mandibles than mm. audience had seen in previous Predators and went a long way toward creating the bestial look the team was going for. Once treated with slime and water spray, the hero head weighed about 13 pounds, while the rubber suit weighed about 60 after adding the wet elements. Nigga, strong than a bitch to be moving around like that. weighed 240 pounds. That meant he was moving over 300 pounds around around on set. This might help his character look massively imposing on screen, but it made his job that much more physically Six, eight. The VFX house NPC then was going crazy. together, creating the CG version of the Predator based off the practical suit and head. Finishing touches included the metallic scars, fluorescent green blood tracking, and cloaking and power glitching effects. These enhancements were designed to uphold the practical feel of the classic suit, while breathing further light into the predator this meant i'm gonna get a prey movie another watch the mouth, articulating the face i heard it was pretty bad though and sometimes subtractive effects like removing the seams of the suit and making the predator's hand appear leaner and more muscled the extraterrestrial wasn't the only terrifying hunter in the film mpc's artists created a small zoo of hair-raising wildlife species all predators in their own right their work included a grizzly bear attack scene filmed with a guy in a bear suit to provide interaction on set. They also created a mm. CG mountain lion, while the wolf scene intercut between an actual canine performer and a CG animal. Other wildlife came to practically, like this animatronic snake. Nasty. Director James Wan wanted to film Malignant with a creepy roving camera that would follow the protagonist's movements from the ceiling, crossing over from room to room. He accomplished this with the spider cam. Juan compared this to a sky camera that can just fly everywhere. Suspended on a cable system, the spider cam can move both vertically and horizontally. That makes it perfect for filming sporting events. And this torturous sequence from Malignant. Damn, I wonder what the movie. From room to room and up the stairs as she grows increasingly panicked. Juan's team also designed the set to resemble a dollhouse without ceilings. That way, the camera and the viewer could That's see hard. Madison in an extended overhead tracking shot, which reflects her building. Wonder what this movie was away. about. There's nobody there. There's nobody there. He looks up and. Ghostbusters Afterlife used complex animatronics to recreate the iconic terror dog from the original movie. Whereas full CGI creatures often appear weightless, this practical approach made the terror dog look more substantial and imposing on screen. Building this massive animatronic was a long complex process. Slobbery. And with this maquette. The model helped capture the dog's design and provide a reference for the VFX team for sequences where it would have to be CGI. 
From there, the team used a mock head to test how the dog's colors would look in different lighting, conducted a movement test with a mini That motherfucker TV running after you. Hooked up to cables to oh, no. I ain't turn around to kick that motherfucker. I'm going to kick a dog. I ain't going to kick that motherfucker. I'm running. Cast that mold and foam latex to create the actual animatronic. I ain't gonna lie to you, dog. Complex mechanics, fiberglass shell, acrylic teeth, and resin horns and nails. The terror dog weighed in at a whopping 450 pounds. To make Damn. sure the puppet was manageable on set, the team never created its back half, leaving CGI to fill in the rest for full body shots. Instead, they attached its top half to a weighted cart, allowing crew members to move the heavy dog around, including placing it on the hood of a car and using CG for the rest. A dog this intimidating had to have Damn. a big chomper. That's partly why its face alone contained 21 servo motors, capable of displacing a lot of skin whenever the dog moved its mouth. A single mouth movement could take a team of three puppeteers performing it via radio control. Placement of the That's crazy. Point was also crucial to get right. Niggas had to be in, in a bag. Roar in a Seamless motion. <sighs> A puppeteer used a separate terror dog leg for this shot where the creature stomps on Paul Rudd's car. He moved the leg by grabbing onto a metal armature inside, but his arm couldn't reach the actual foot. So the team incorporated a series of cables to create lifelike ankle and toe movements, showing the foot flexing and adjusting as the dog's weight comes down Bro. on the car. You gotta be thinking in multiple dimensions when you're making a movie, bro. It's more than just the eye can see. Tropical destination into a nightmare scape. By building a massive to cut the characters off from the outside world. To make the wide open coast and old start to feel like a prison, M. Night Shyamalan turned to production designer Naaman Marshall. Naaman took hmm. measurements and photographs of the filming site at Playa El Valle. That's a good ass movie. Existing rock wall as their starting point. I fuck with O. He then built an expanded rock wall model and blended it into Bro, every little layer like it's bro it's that motherfuckers a little design you a movie is a design you you just see the finish the finished product look cheesy and good and shit but you don't even know how many layers went into this shit foot wide barrier in time for filming digital effects expanded the wall even more dramatically in post using photographs of the natural look at all of that its surface textures this attention to detail is what made the steep weighty wall so realistic making an otherwise idyllic setting feel confined and sinister as Naaman put it the beach becomes the villain <sighs> the dub. 